All right, we're in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to focus in on verses 5 and 6, but I'll start in verse 1 just to bring in the context. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope laid out for you in heaven. And this is where we pick up where we left off. He says, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world that is bearing fruit and increasing just as it does among you also since the day that you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. And so he starts about starts off talking about this hope that is laid up for them in heaven. And he says, of this, of this hope, um, you've, you've heard about before in the word of truth, the gospel. Okay, so what is this hope that Paul's talking to them about in this passage? Well, the hope is Jesus, right? Um, Jesus is our redeemer. He's our savior. And it's through Jesus that we receive our hope of eternal life. Through him, we receive our salvation. Um, through him, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, the promise of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Um, the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us and makes us day by day into the image of Christ. It is in Jesus that we're promised a day of um, the Lord where he's going to return and he's going to uh, transform our lowly bodies to be like his heavenly body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Um, it is that day that he's going to usher in a new heavens and a new earth and a new kingdom where righteousness dwells and we're going to live and, and reign with him for all of eternity. And that is the hope. Um, and later on in the chapter, he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is that hope of glory that is laid up for us in heaven. And he says, of this you have heard. Remember last time we talked about how faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? And this is how the gospel is received. It is through hearing or through receiving, right? And so he says in Romans 10, how can they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And so there, there's a quote by a guy named St. Francis of Assisi. Um, it says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I know it's been quoted often, um, but I really like this quote um, because the heart of it is this. We should preach the gospel with our lives, with the way that we live our lives, with the way that we treat other people, right? We should preach the gospel with our love and with our graciousness and our gentleness and our kindness toward other people, um, with our generosity. And with our authenticity too, and I think this is something that we miss sometimes as believers, um, that we should be authentic people, that we should live our faith authentically and transparently in front of other people. In other words, I'm not trying to put a mask on and pretend like we're better than we are or that we're something that we're not. Um, because a lot of times the world sees through that anyway. And so all they see is hypocrisy when we do that. Um, but rather just living like through the trials that we face, um, living that with the fruit of the spirit of peace, Right? Going through hard things, but having the peace of God in the midst of it because we know um, uh, that, that he's our savior and that we our hope is in him and not in the things of this world. Or um, or when we fall or fail or mess up, just like owning it and living it, like being respons taking responsibility for it, and then just um, getting back on track and looking back to the savior uh, from whom our redemption comes. And just, you know, it's but, but being authentic and living our faith right in front of everybody. Because really, um, as Paul said, I'd, I'd rather boast in my weakness that he may be glorified glorified, right? Because when I'm weak, then he is strong. In other words, he gets glory, the glory. He gets magnified. Um, and, and, and people just, you know, I mean, they see our brokenness anyway. So why not just be honest about it? Um, but he says, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. There is a verse that says, um, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to give an answer at all times um, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. Only do so with gentleness and respect. And I've always loved that verse too, because it really ties in with what St. Francis said, which was um, basically um, live your life in front of people um, in a way that preaches the gospel, but also um, be ready to preach the gospel. Like we definitely need words too. Okay. Words are definitely necessary. It's just that they're not always necessary um, it, as the first thing. We don't need to lead in with preach, preach, preach. We need to lead in with live and example and not being 
hypocrites, right? The, the, but, but preaching doesn't happen or sharing the gospel, that doesn't happen by osmosis. It can't be totally communicated um, through just living in front of someone. Um, it must be shared also overtly. The gospel must be communicated in order to be received. And, and that can happen through speaking, can happen through um, writing, can happen through sign language, it can happen through braille. Um, there's lots of ways that it can be communicated, but the gospel definitely needs to be communicated. It says, of this hope you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. And that word gospel, um, we've said it before, means good news, right? But why do we call the gospel good news? Um, I think the answer is pretty complicated. I think it's because it means good news, right? Because it's good news. The gospel is good news. Um, so the gospel, this is what the gospel is not, okay? You need to clean yourself up and get your act together. You really need to stop talking that way and listening to that music and watching those movies and hanging out with those people and going to those places and saying those things. And when you get yourself all cleaned up, then you can come to God. And if he's feeling really merciful and loving that day, maybe he'll give you his salvation. Um, yeah, that's not the gospel at all. And yet what's weird is a lot of times I feel like that's what the world perceives um, from us. That's the message that they're receiving from us. And if that's the message that they're receiving from us, then we're preaching a different gospel, whether we know it or want to admit it or not. Because the gospel looks like this. Though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive in Christ. Amen? Um, the gospel says that though, although we were messed up and we were broken and we were born in sin and iniquity and death, and though we could do nothing to save ourselves because all of our righteous works are like filthy rags, God saved us, right? He, God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, that he let his son shed his own blood on the cross to pay the massive penalty for our own sin and then, and then, and then gave us the righteousness of his son by which we can be saved and stand in his presence and be reconciled to him. Um, that is the good news. And that's why the gospel is good news because we are um, saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Of this you've heard before and in the word of, word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. And remember the Colossians received the gospel through the ministry of Epaphras, who probably received it from the ministry of Paul while he was in Ephesus. Um, so he brought the gospel the 100 miles to Colossae, preached the gospel to them. Many were saved and this church was planted. And now these people are beginning to grow up in the spirit. Paul has already told them that he's heard about their, their love for all the saints, which is a manifestation of genuine true faith. And so this church is growing and it's thriving. We're going to talk about later how there's some influences that have started to come in. Um, but but the, the gospel is thriving there in Colossae. He says, the gospel has come to you as indeed in the whole world that is bearing fruit and increasing. And so at the time of this letter, it's about AD 62. Um, it's about 30 years or so since the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ when he sent his Holy Spirit um, on the church on the day of Pentecost to empower the church in order to accomplish his mission, to move forward his mission and his ministry <clears throat> on the earth, um, expanding his kingdom upon the earth. And so in that time, that 30 years, um, this is how far the gospel has penetrated to the point where Paul can literally say in the whole world, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. Now, does that mean that the gospel had been preached to every person? No. Does it mean that it had gone to every village and every city and every corner of all the, the whole earth? No, it doesn't mean that either. What it does mean, what Paul is saying is that everywhere the gospel goes, it is powerful to bear fruit and increase. And, and But what does that mean, bearing fruit and increasing? Um, I think we would all agree it definitely means evangelism, right? That's definitely a part of what the gospel was doing and is doing today. Um, bearing fruit and increasing means that as it goes out, gospels preached, produces hope in the heart of the believer, and then that hope um, gives way to faith, and that faith produces love, um, that the believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit, they're added to the church. Um, so that whole function of the gospel in evangelism definitely was taking place within the world. world, world. But what I want to ask is, do you think that's the only thing that Paul means by bearing fruit and increasing? Or could it be that the gospel um, uh, has more um, to offer us than just evangelism? I, I think it does. And, and the reason I think that is this. Um, he says, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. And he says, just as it does among you. Okay. And so this work of the gospel in Colossae had begun by evangelism. I'm sure continued in evangelism. I'm sure there were more people being saved and added to the church daily. And yet the work of the gospel continued in them. This was ongoing. See, the gospel... <clears throat> is preached. It produces hope. Hope produces faith. Faith gives way to love. Um, 
in that love, hope is built and grown and hope swells up as the tangible promise of God become manifested in our life. They become real and tangible to us and it causes us to hope more. More faith is, it rises up and love is, is abounding, right? Um, and so as this gospel work continues in us, it, it doesn't only save us, but it continues to sanctify us and it continues to finish the work of Christ in us through the Spirit of God. And this is my point is that we are always in need. I am always in need of receiving the gospel of truth. I'm always in need of hearing the good news over me. Um, like, for instance, I'll give you some examples, right? If I was to fall in some kind of sin and, and I'm drifting in my uh, relationship with God, um, I may be bowed down under a weight of shame that that, that, that that I can barely lift my eyes up to even think about asking for forgiveness. Um, but when I'm in that state, the gospel tells me that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, no matter how bad my sin. The gospel tells me that my, though my sins are as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. The gospel reminds me that God showed his love first in us through this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> in other words, um, like if he, was, if he saved me while I was yet a sinner, how much more will he forgive me now that I'm a son? I'm reminded of the leper that cried out to the Lord, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And what did Jesus do? He looked at him with compassion. He reached out and touched the unclean leper. And he said, I am willing, be clean. What about when I feel alone or betrayed um, by someone that I loved or trusted? Someone stabs me in the back. I remember that the Lord knows my pain, that he has felt the sting of betrayal himself. And I'm reminded that though the whole world may leave me or forsake me, the Bible tells me that God will never leave me or forsake me. What about when I'm just suffering? Life is hard sometimes. Say a business venture fails, tragedy strikes someone um, close to me, someone that I love or me. Um, what if I'm just looking around me and sort of despairing over the condition of the world? Um, <laughs> when I'm in a state like that, when I'm suffering, when I'm struggling, when I'm trying to understand, the gospel tells me and reminds me and preaches to my soul that this world is not my home, that my citizenship is in heaven. And from there, I await a savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform my lowly body to be like his heavenly body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. And at that point, he's going to usher in a new kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth where righteousness dwells. And I'll get to be there with him. What about when I'm sick? I remember the words of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. And we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I might remember the story of the centurion whose servant was healed with a word, or the woman that reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and power went out of him to heal her. What about the blind man at the temple that told the Pharisees, though I was blind, now I see. The lepers that cried out to him from the side of the road, the man with the withered hand who was made whole at the synagogue, or the lame man that Jesus told him, pick up your mat and go home. What about when I'm just tired, and I'm exhausted, I'm spent, and I have nothing left to give? I remember that Jesus tells me, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What about when I face death, when I literally stand at death's door and there will be no healing this time? Well, then the gospel reminds me that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that if this earthly tent is destroyed, I have a building from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Yes, the gospel saves me, but the gospel also sanctifies me and the gospel holds me until the day of Christ Jesus. And he says, just as it does among you since the day that you heard of it, the day that they heard the gospel, it began its work in them. Amen. So the, the Bible tells us that the word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit. The gospel began to do its work in them the moment they heard it, and it continued to do that work in them as they grew up into maturity in Christ. Honestly, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I've gone already over my 15 minutes, and so let's just continue in the next video.